We are back and doing it a little differently today. Do you want to give folks a little preview of what we have in store? We are. I'm calling in from Tokyo right now and my video is glitching out a little bit. Um, but today we have S1 Madness. So over the past 24 hours, I think six companies have filed their S1s. We're looking at uh, Snowflake, Ant Global, Amwell, Sumo Logic. Uh, we are looking at Unity and we're looking at Asana. So just a crazy amount of volume in the S1 space, companies filing to go public. Bill Gurley would be upset. These are all filing to go public in traditional IPOs. Well, Where do you actually, want to start? Asana, Asana is a direct listing, right? Oh, okay, so Asana is a direct listing. Yeah, so the rest all, are IPOs. No, yeah, no new money, just existing shareholders and uh, employees selling. Um, looks like it's going to be a 1.5 billion valuation. Is that, I mean, to, to me, that sounds, you know, relatively reasonable given the hype of this market. I know that you've kind of find Asana to be maybe the most boring of this group. So maybe we should get it out of the way. Do you have any big thoughts on this one? I don't. I think Asana, you know, when I'm looking at these kinds of products, I'm looking at stickiness. And in my experience using Asana, I think I've started using Asana 50 different times and gotten teams to start using Asana 50 different times. And we always go back to Google Docs or Trello or one of its many, many competitors. I think there's a lot of companies that do the same job to be done as Asana uh, and it's not particularly sticky, but I know you've used it as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I dig it. I think it works well. Uh, the, the things that I've been interested in from the filing so far and the coverage it's gotten, one has a dual class share structure similar to Google. So founders really are keeping most of the voting power here. Uh, Moskovitz, has 39% of voting power himself. His co-founder, Justin Rosenstein, has 17.5%. So they're really keeping the reins pretty tight. Uh, you know, that's similar to folks like Google and, and other tech companies that have tried to use that. Well, um, and Facebook, where, where yeah. Moskowitz comes from. Amen, that's right. Um, and then the other thing that I think is, is interesting about this, um, you know, they have 75,000 paying customers and uh, more than 1.2 million paid users, which is, I guess, you know, accounting it on a, a, a member basis, but still are not profitable. Um, they've accumulated a deficit of 36, uh, 365.6 million. And, you know, they obviously cite that as a risk, as with so many of these tech startups that, you know, profitability is still a ways away. Yeah, do you want to go into direct listing versus IPO here? Because that's interesting that you know they've run up this deficit and they're not raising fresh capital. What do you think the differences are between why? Why do you think five of them are going public via traditional IPO when there's been so much hype around direct, direct listing? And why do you think Asana would do a direct listing? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think they probably are happy for a little bit less scrutiny on them. Um, you know, it's allowed them to run a little bit more secretive of a process. Um, they also seem to be a little bit less of a mature company than some of the others that are, are going public now. But I'm, I'm going to put my hands up and say that I really don't have a hot take on direct listings versus traditional IPOs. It just sort of seems like, you know, uh, it's good to have an additional option out there. But curious if you have, a, you know, maybe a stronger, a stronger take. Yeah, my take is you know, I think I bought into the direct listing hype a little bit. A couple of my favorite companies, uh, Spotify and Slack, both went public that way um, and both stumbled a little bit and took a little while to, to kind of pick up steam and Spotify has, Slack hasn't. I think one of the interesting things in this market is that no matter where you price the IPO, some companies like Snowflake, which we'll talk about, is probably going to run no matter what. You could price it at a $50 billion valuation or a $10 billion valuation and it's going to run and then others probably won't. So I think maybe some of that gap that, that Bill Gurley talks about between where she has price and where they close, um, I think some of that might just be a natural consequence of the type of market that we're, that we're in. Yeah. And do you want to talk about Snowflake? I know that one you know, gets you a little bit more jazzed. What, what do you think are the sort of key narratives here? Uh, so I think the key narrative in a bunch of these, when we're talking about, uh, we're talking about SaaS companies and, and companies, uh, I, do you want to pull up the tweet actually, uh, the Zach tweet? I think yeah. the big story with Snowflake is their net dollar retention. So that means 
that every customer that they have, how much more they spend in the next period, Snowflakes is 158%. So that means if I spend $100 on Snowflake this quarter, I'm gonna spend 158 uh, the same quarter next year. So that's just an insane amount of growth. One of the interesting risks with them though, and those, their existing clients better be growing, is that they have super high customer concentration. I think 11% of their revenue comes from one customer uh, and that's Capital One. So really risky from that perspective. And I think they say in the perspectives that they need to get their sales and marketing act together. Ooh, wow. So they've got to keep Capital One as happy as possible. Um, and there were some dueling tweets actually. So this got to the same uh, point from uh, Chetan here. Um, and then, you know, some other things about the Snowflake S1 that I thought were interesting is just how baller the team is. The CEO of Snowflake um, used to be CEO of ServiceNow, which has just been on a tear. He took it from a hundred million to 1.4 billion in revenue. Um, he was before that CEO of a company called Data Domain that sold for 2.4 billion to EMC. So Frank Slootman is his name, which also gotta love the name. Um, and the Slootmeister is ready to to get another one on the board. You know, go three for three. And this. This is a big win. This was incubated out of Sutter Hill Ventures, I believe, right? So this yeah, is a right. big win for in-house incubation, which don't see a lot of multi-billion dollar IPOs there. That's right. Yeah, the Entrepreneur in Residence program gets a, a big takeaway story. Also, a, a small fun fact about the founders, apparently um, founded in 2012 and named Snowflake because all three of them very much like to ski. <laughs> it's beautiful. What does Snowflake do? Oh man, this is going to get tricky uh, for me. <laughs> so basically they uh, help with data warehousing is how I understood it. Justin Gage from Retool had a really great thread about this. Um, and I'm going to pull it up so that I uh, can, can speak to this more effectively. But basically it's like a more queryable data warehouse. So you can use SQL, which is helpful um, for more complex queries. Um, do you want to help me out here? Yeah, so I, you know, this is not my, this is not my area of expertise, but one of the things that I found interesting is that when they risk, they, they list their risks and their competitors, their competitors are the same companies that they also work with and build on top of. So Amazon with AWS, Google with Google Cloud, Microsoft with Azure. So to the extent that these companies decide to not be so nice to Snowflake at, at some point in the future and, and make it harder to operate Snowflake on top of their, their clouds in favor of their own cloud storage and database tools, uh, that's a big risk to the business. Yeah, I'm excited to dig into this one. It's one of those ideas or companies that I have sort of a, a vague sense of, um, it, but, but very little actual uh, explanation. So this is a good example of the Feynman test failing me. You know, like Richard Feynman would say, you don't really know something until you can teach it. I definitely cannot teach this. Yeah, I've had a, a vague awareness, I think like you, from kind of software VC Twitter, that they've been excited about this company for a long time without ever having used it myself, given that I'm not a machine learning engineer. Yeah, totally. I mean, their, their performance is remarkable. I mean, you mentioned uh, retention. Revenue also spiked 174% over the last fiscal year. Um, you know, other customers in the mix, Netflix, Lululemon, also University of uh, Notre Dame. So uh, Fighting Irish fans can, can be happy. They're going to be upping their, their internet and cloud usage as they move back off campus. There you go, exactly. After a COVID scare. Um, and then, you know, the sort of third one in the mix and arguably the most uh, exciting, I would say, is Unity. So Unity is, is really interesting. Unity is a game engine uh, that game developers can build on top of. And so there's really two engines that people build almost any game that you can think of on top of. It's the Unity engine and the Unreal engine, which is owned by Epic. Uh, Unity is generally for mobile games and easier to make games, whereas Unreal is for richer uh, immersive environments. I'm gonna pull up a, a slide here because one of the interesting things that I don't think people realize about the game engines is just how much is built on top of the game engines that aren't games, uh, including mm. buildings. And so when I lived in Brooklyn, and I'll be back there soon, but in my old building, the building right next door to us here, 9D College being built, all designed on top of Unity engine. 
And so that allows you to play with physics and to walk through buildings like you'd be walking through a game. And so these environments are super rich and immersive. They actually see the opportunity uh, as bigger in non-game uses of their, of their product. They see, I think, $12 billion in market opportunity in games. And they see another, I think, $17 billion in non-game uses of their product. So as more and more uh, gets built kind of virtually before we build it in the real world or built virtually totally, it's a huge opportunity for, for somebody like Unity. Wow, that's super interesting. I actually wasn't aware of how much um, opportunity they saw beyond gaming, especially because they are crushing gaming. They have something like 53% <laughs> of the top 1,000 games in iOS App Store and Google Play that are built with Unity, 2 billion monthly active end users, 8 billion hours of gameplay a month. I mean, they, uh, they're really crushing it. And on top of that, the decision to go public now feels just savage given what's happening to Epic, right? It does. So Epic is in the middle of its fight with, uh, with Apple over its 30% fees. We talked about that last week. Uh, Unity is, is taking advantage. It would be incredibly impressive legal and financial work if they've been able to prepare the, the S1 in the past two weeks since that happened. So this has certainly been in the offing, but feels like an opportune time to, to attack. Yeah, it does. Just rubbing salt in the wound. As you said, no, no shot that this is a, a response to that, but the timing feels like it couldn't be better for them. Totally. And I think one of the other interesting things to, to talk about with Unity's business is that they really have these two pieces. They have create and they have operate. And so when you think of the engine again, you're thinking about the create, people building games. They also really want to focus on distribution, helping uh, their clients get games out there and then monetizing. And so they talk about the fact that whereas maybe 10 years ago, particularly in the West, games were fully monetized through being able to purchase a game. In the app store, you buy a game, you go to the store, you buy a game. Now so much more is happening via advertising uh, and in-game purchases that they're essentially building kind of an advertising and in-game purchase network that you can plug into your game if you use Unity. So that was, I think, an interesting thing that I hadn't really realized about, about the business. Yeah, that's super interesting. One, one more, if we're talking about, so I wrote about Tencent, so I'm primed uh, to, to a lot of this, but so Tencent owns 40% of Unity's competitor, Epic. They also have WeChat and WeChat Pay. WeChat Pay's uh, biggest competitor, Ant Financial, which used to be Alipay, owned by Alibaba, also going public. Do you want to guess their total payment volume for the past year? Okay, I'm actually interested to see how, how close I can get here. Um, okay, so I know that they have 700 million monthly active users. So, I don't know, do they, do they send 10 bucks a month? Uh, I'm going to say 600 billion. Off by 3x. So that is uh, 118 trillion RMB, which translates to about 1.7 trillion dollars. I knew it was going to be in the volume. trillions. I'd hate myself. For, com <laughs> for comparison, <laughs> PayPal, which is a public company in the $200 billion valuation range, PayPal does uh, did 221 billion in the last quarter. So annualizes to about 800 million. So they're pretty much double PayPal's total payment volume and are looking to go public at around the same valuation, looking to go public at about $225 billion valuation. So just an absolute monster company here. That's interesting. So that's more even than when I read about it yesterday. And I did like a little brief video talking about it where the sort of, uh, price was pegged at 200 billion would be the biggest um, listing ever for a global stock market. But sounds like it's already ticked up a little bit. Um, there were some of the investors in, uh, in Ant Financial that are actually marking it up at 300 billion, maybe in the expectation that this one could run too. We'll see if that happens. Um, but this one also was really interesting to me because of where they're listing. I don't know if you've spent any time looking at the star market, but honestly, the the ant story was the first time I had really dug into it. Are you familiar with it at all? Can you tell me a little bit? When you say the star market? I, I, I really set you up there. Um, 
basically the start. Because I know they're, they're joint listing in Shanghai and in Hong Kong. Yeah. Is one yeah, of them nicknamed so, the star market? Yeah, the Shanghai one is the star market. And um, it's really a pretty top-down creation from the Chinese government. Like Xi Jinping was basically like, cool, we need to have a tech-centric uh, listing spot, uh, exchange to really rival the NASDAQ. And Ant is really going to be sort of the, the jewel in this crown, it seems like. So kind of a coup for, for that exchange. Yeah, I spent the last couple of weeks digging into the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and, and converting prices to USD. So I'm more familiar now than I was, uh, was a couple of weeks ago. But yeah, this will certainly be one of the biggest, uh, biggest listed. In um, Asia. No, sorry. Go ahead. Please. I was just going to say one other point. Um, I wanted to jump on for Unity is also run by a huge baller. Um, this guy, who I just love this little picture of him just living his life. Um, his name is uh, John Ricciatiello. And before Unity, he was uh, president and CEO of EA in the game. Love it. As well as a PE, PE guy. Um, and I think we missed one of the greatest parts about the Unity listing, which is their ticker. And Packy, I know you have some thoughts on this. Yeah, they got the U ticker. There are 26 letters in the alphabet. I think 23 or 24 of them are taken. Uh, Unity was able to get the letter U. I think what we have left, and I'm shocked that Unilever doesn't have that actually. What we have left is P. Pandora was bought, I believe, by Liberty. Uh, and so P is back on the market. But yeah, U has one of the 26 single letter tickers, single letter letter tickers uh, in the US. Do you think uh, just as we're, go ahead. No, 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 go for it. I was just going to say, as we're talking about Unity's founder and CEO, wanted to show his competition doesn't look quite as cool but also a total baller. This one's small, but that's, that is Epic's Tim Sweeney right there. Just love these, these middle-aged dudes controlling the, the hours spent by you know, all of the nine to 25 year olds in the world. Amen. Um, and Tim Sweeney, he apparently founded uh, Epic when he was like 20 in college and it was called Potomac Systems or something like that. Potomac yes. Computer Systems. Apparently also a lover of Kentucky, Kentucky Fried Chicken, a very random fact for you. I did not know that. Yeah, huge. And your life is better now because of it. Um, it is. There's, so what you, else? No, I was just going to say, do you think there's any shot Palantir takes the P? Oh, I like that. Would be a I real like power Palantir's move. Palantir is going to... Oh. <laughs> I feel like Palantir is going to have a, a secret unlisted, uh, unlisted ticker. So just keeping in, keeping in uh, character there. But yeah, uh, that brings us to our next point. So there are two other huge IPOs that we don't have S1s for yet, but have confidentially filed. That's Airbnb uh, and that's Palantir. So be on the lookout for, for those two. And then according to David Pierce, there are seven or eight other IPOs that we may see this year. DoorDash, which I'm excited for, Procore, ThreadUp, Poshmark, GitLab, potentially Compass, and I would pay a lot of money to see those financials. Mm. And he said, we see WeWork go public via a SPAC. It would be as 2020 as things get. So I'm excited to see what else we get, but there is plenty to dig into for now. Oh my gosh, WeWork via a SPAC would be, yeah, we would have to do a special three-hour show and just try and call Scott Galloway in as often as possible. Um, to I don't always up. agree with the prof, but he, he nailed WeWork. He, he really nailed WeWork. Um, cool. I mean, I feel like that's probably all we have to say unless you have uh, something else to add. I don't think so. I'm excited to see how these go. I guess, do you want to pick, if you had a million dollar portfolio, mm. how would you invest it in these S1s? It's a great question. I would probably put it into a nice Vanguard account and let it accumulate <laughs> slowly over time. <laughs> um, okay, I think I'm, I think I'm a buyer at this point of Snowflake. I mean, it depends, I guess, how fast it runs up before I can even get any cash in. But um, feels like no, we're getting we're getting allocation. 
So oh, you're getting it at the. Good. Cool. I'm definitely in. I'm definitely in at that. Um, uh, and and this is all we should disclose with very little research at this point. So please don't take anything <laughs> I say as any real advice. Um, we are going to be digging deep into the S1 Club in the next couple weeks into all three of the ones we highlighted today. But at this point, really shooting from the hip. Um, so I think I'm a buyer of Snowflake. Um, I think I am uh, a, a more tentative buyer of Asana, and I'm definitely a buyer of Unity. I mean, I think it's super interesting. Palantir, my moral compass would, uh, I would just feel too icky. Um, and um, who else is in the mix? Airbnb? Yeah, I'm a buyer. Uh, depending on pricing, I'm a buyer. And same for Ant. I mean, stocks, How about you? stocks only go up. So <laughs> buying everything. <laughs> you just bought it all. So if I have to do, if I have to to do a, a balanced portfolio with my million dollars, I think I'm putting half of it in Unity. Frankly, I'm gonna put uh, gonna put another ten percent in Snowflake. Uh, we didn't touch on Amwell, but I'll put a little bit in Amwell just to play the the telehealth game. Uh, Teladoc has run up 157 percent year to date, and so the the telehealth space is hot. Uh, and then I'm going to put a bunch of it in Airbnb. Asana, I think I'm I'm not short, but I'm not I'm not long. Uh, but I'm going to put a bunch in Airbnb, assuming that it's not going to get the uh, quite the reaction that it would have gotten nine months ago. I mean, I think I'm just going to go all in on Tesla still. So uh, that's really the only the only, smart only reasonable strategy. <laughs> uh, I think that's right. All right, man. Well, this was fun as always. Um, People should let us know whether they like this versus the old way or they want us to talk about other stuff. I, I would like to hear that. I'd like to hear that as well. Yeah, rip us, rip us apart. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's plenty, uh, plenty of fodder, especially my explanation of Snowflake. So educate me. <laughs> <laughs> but we are long. We have no idea what it does, but yeah. super long. So. <laughs> I'm all in on this. <laughs> uh, awesome. See you, dude. See you next time.